Um, actually, this is not. This this it was this was supposed to be the opening slide of my presentation, but I woke up this morning and I thought about yesterday's event, and I thought we all deserve a better opening than the real slide, and the real slide is this. Um, the title of my talk today is Overcoming Despair, Helping Parents of Adult Invisible Children. Um, a year and a half ago, when um, I began thinking about what to say today, quite, quite a long time, um, I came to Haim because Haim is also a stakeholder in, in what we call entitled dependence. And I, I, I came to him to ask his opinion about what to speak about. And I had this great, fantastic idea. Uh, the idea was that I'm going to speak about, I'm, I'm also somewhat of a philosopher, not just a psychologist. And uh, I thought maybe we will announce something new, something really grand, like there is a new authority. Maybe we will announce that now we are going to we're going into new autonomy, which is another branch, another practice. And uh, Haim uh, listened to me, and he has this, uh, this way of listening. He listens to you like he's very interested in, in what you say, and you don't always know what he's thinking. So he listened and listened, and then he said, look, why don't you just talk about what you do? Okay. <laughs> and I said, okay, we'll leave the philosophy aside and I will talk about what I do and how I do it and I will try to be as pragmatic as possible. Uh, but first, perhaps a few words about what are adult children and why we call them invisible. Since the inception of NVR in 1995, 1996, um, it has been quite clear and not really discussed that NVR is um, uh, targeting parents of children. And although the question was never really asked or discussed, children were understood to be people, young people aged 6 to 18, children and adolescents, uh, usually suffering from various externalizing or, ex or internalizing disorders, disruptive conduct disorders, ODD, as we heard yesterday, um, self-destructive children, and on the other side, various forms of anxiety. And this was, this was true, and this went on. But as we know, anxiety and uh, um, disruptive disorders and self-destructive conditions do not end at the age of 18. It, it doesn't go away when you're 18. So, at about the year uh, 2009, um, after Eli Leibowitz and Haim wrote together the book, the, the, the first publications about uh, children's fears, and Haim really became a household word in Israel. Many, many people knew him. And, uh, uh, and ask for his help. It was only natural that many families of older children, or children above 18, with anxiety and with various forms of externalizing problems, started, started calling Haim uh, and calling other people who were practicing NVR privately and not privately in Israel and asking, maybe you can help us. Because we have a 25-year-old, we have a 30-year-old, we have a 35-year-old who's terrorizing us, uh, who is dysregulated emotionally, who is not doing much with his life because he seems very, very afraid of adulthood. Can you help us? And uh, we tried. And we started meeting with these families. And here is the picture we saw. We saw, we met families with adult parents families whose um, uh, children were living in, the childhood, in their own childhood rooms, in their old rooms. Um, they were um, receiving many resources from their parents, much more than ever 
or th than, than is usual or acceptable in the ages of 2025. Money, various services. Um, they were not working, they were not in academic studies, or they were perhaps having some very small trivial, trivial work experience. They were trying to work, but evidently they were just not succeeding in, in integrating into the workforce or into academic studies. Um, many, many of them were sleeping during the day and awake during the night. Also, um, another very frequent uh, characteristic was a, a, an intense addiction to digital media. Uh, people sitting, uh, playing network games for 17 hours a day, not sleeping almost. Um, of course, they were living in social withdrawal. Uh, this condition, this, this, this kind of people we met all along the life cycle. We had 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old, and so we could start telling the story or the developmental story of, this, of, of people living in this way with um, the number of friends and social relations dwindling, decreasing as time goes by. All of them were blaming their parents for their condition, very strongly. They were clinging to these parents. Remember the word clinging from Ellie's presentation yesterday, or the day before yesterday, clinging to their parents, but blaming them. Many of them had suicide thoughts. Some of them had previous suicide attempts. And even if they were not having suicide thoughts or attempts, in each and every case we met, the parents were expressing suicidal concerns uh, about their children. And very often also, this population was refusing treatment. So th that's, you remember how we started. We started with parents uh, of children 18 plus, hearing about Heinz and Heim and his colleagues work with younger children, seeking help, with externalizing or internalizing disorders. And then that is the picture we found. We did not expect to find this picture because we were only told that these are problems which are very similar to those of younger children. So in addition to all what we said now, they also had externalizing or internalizing problems, but these problems in the context that we met were, look, were looking entirely different or were looking like something that NVR could perhaps address, could perhaps address successfully, but certainly uh, it was apparent that we, we would need to work in order to understand this condition better and not assume that everything that works for a 10 year old or a 15 year old would work for a 20 or 25 year old living like that. Now, we felt that we are looking at a distinct population but we really didn't know what to call them. So one option uh, was to see, to see them as, as people with mental disorders, mental impairment, mental problems. But they were not the same as this population because there are, as we know, many people with mental problems who are living so-called functional lives. They're not necessarily dependent as these people were. We also could not call them the population of unemployed because there are Many of the, all of them were, but many unemployed people do not live like that. We could not call them disabled because apparently these, these people, some of them had very high skills and, and high intelligence and high capabilities. So we could, not, we could not really see them as disabled, although they were acting as if they were disabled. And we could not call it a temporary life crisis as well, because unless a, life, a temporary life crisis lasts 10 years and more. So we went to the literature. The literature back in 2009 did not offer us much to hang on to. Um, the most immediate term was hikikomori. That is the closest we came to some form of characterization which was not just slang, but, but a, a real attempt by the Japanese government and, uh, and Japanese researchers to, to uh, name a social phenomenon that's been going on in Japan since the 80s young people who are withdrawing into their childhood rooms, not coming out at all, uh, highly dependent on their parents, 
uh, engrossed in computer games, but there was a problem with this hikikomori uh, uh, label because um, hikikomoris are people who do not leave home at all, and our, our people were occasionally venturing out of the home, although as the years progressed, they, they, their, their, uh, their mobility uh, decreased and, and they were uh, spending more and more time at the parental home. And also, the Japanese definition of hikikomori holds the official ministry of uh, Japanese Ministry of Health or Labor definition holds only if, if, of, if hikikomori are not diagnosable otherwise. So the, if they're not suffering from other known forms of conditions, psychiatric conditions. And in our case, we do feel that, uh, that uh, our population is composed of both people who suffered from known and diagnosed or diagnosable uh, conditions and not. So, and there, there's a huge amount of slang around, uh, varying from culture to culture, but we really, really couldn't use slang as a construct, so that didn't help us as well. Um, the concept of emerging adulthood, a concept that was coined in the year 2000 by Jeffrey Arnett, um, uh, you know, a North American researcher in Clark University who was uh, trying to characterize what happens to adolescents at 18. Uh, today, adolescents at 18 do not exactly become socially adult. It takes them another 8 to 10 years to form into fully uh, so-called adults. And he called this phase in life, he, he said this is a new phase of development, especially in developing countries. And he called it emerging adulthood. And we like that very much, except that our adults were not emerging. So they were kind of non-emergent adults. And that, that, that focused our, 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 our perspective a little. But instead of another synonym for non-emerging adults, which is very long, as we called them, we, we said this is a failure to emerge, and we called them adult children, which was, is a kind of a paradoxical term. I refer back to Arist's lecture from yesterday. He talked about polycontextuality, and these people were really living in both contexts. They were adults and they were children at the same time, which made it very hard to interpret and relate to. Okay, uh, this, this was taken in Japan. Uh, I, I guess that these, these pictures vary from culture to culture. Adult children. Okay, let's say a few words about what makes these adult children invisible, why we call them invisible. Um, we call them invisible uh, because Let's, let's start with the immediate, the clinical aspect of it. First of all, we don't see them, so it's not really clinical, but their parents say to us, one father said to us, I think one, in one of our first cases, he said to us, um, there, he, was a, he had a 17-year-old boy who was not coming out of his room, has not come out of his room for half a year because he also had his uh, a bathroom unit within that room, and the father, who was living at the same floor as this young person said, I haven't seen my son for half a year. I, I hardly remember what his face looks like. And he was crying. Or a mother uh, who said, um, I'm living with my son. There's only a wall that separates us for 10 years. And the closest, and the more we live, and the closer we live, the less I feel I know who he is. So this is one aspect of of uh, uh, invisibility. The other aspect of invisibility is that these people are usually quite invisible to the social services, to all kinds of establishments and institutions. These people are not, um, are not treated as such, are not characterized as such by social services, at least not in Israel. Uh, they are not known as such to the psychiatric establishment. They're certainly not known as such to the police. And uh, they are not, there, there's no mechanism for predicting or trying to uh, understand what, is the pre what predisposes people to uh, become like that. This is all very new. Uh, there's a lot of 
research going on right now to try and understand what happens to these uh, uh, adult children. I was, I, I believe that in 2009, the surge of interest in, in NVR for these people is partially a result of this invisibility to all known or conventional forms of intervention. And I, I, I'm proud to say that uh, this year, in Tiberias, uh, we had a conference of uh, the social services department of the, the municipality of Tiberias, and it was a social worker conference, under the first conference ever under the title, which used the title Entitled Dependence as a Problem in Elderly Abuse. And when meeting these social workers who uh, spend enormous amounts of time and efforts in, in understanding and trying to prevent elderly abuse, we actually understood that a large percentage of their cases where 40 and 50, people, 50 year old people abuse their parents, live together with them and abuse them, are actually cases of what we called or termed entitled dependence, which started 30 years ago, but there was no real perception that it is a distinct phenomenon, so there was no specific intervention for this, and we're, we're beginning to think of how much work we can save these social workers if we start the preventive work much earlier. Uh, I don't want to delve too deep into this because I want to leave as much time for what we do, but one clue, one hint as to the etiology of this, of this group, of this population, we find in the, in the 2014 research uh, conducted in 11 European countries over a population of 12,000 adolescents. Um, I'm, I'm happy to say that Israel is represented by uh, Professor Alan Apter from the Schneider's Medical Children's Hospital. And in this study, it's truly fascinating um, there, there are, uh, are 12,000 adolescents from 11 uh, European Union countries. The independent variable was a, a, a survey of risk behaviors, various risk behaviors. The risk behaviors are, are listed here. And um, the, the dependent variables was psychopathologies with all kinds of mental disorders, impairments, problems, distresses. And the analysis was latent class analysis, which uh, is analysis that is very open to whatever. It, it does not ask a question. It does not make a hypothesis. So, and we had, and they had three clusters there. Uh, they had a low risk class, a high risk class, and an invisible risk class. We're talking adolescents. I mean, adolescents, people, uh, people uh, between roughly 12 and 18. The low risk class were people who were low in all risk categories. The high risk class were relative with a cluster that was high on most risk behavior categories. And then we had an invisible cl risk class. Why invisible? Because they were, they were um, high only on three main categories, which is high media use, high media addiction, uh, sedentary behavior, they were sitting a lot all day, and they had sleeping problems. Well, why is this interesting? Because when we look at the dependent variable, when we look at their psychopathological profiles or epidemiology, we find this. We find that the high-risk class and the invisible risk class were suffering from similar levels of psychopathological problems. There was a similar prevalence of suicidal thoughts, anxiety, depression, lack of pro-social behavior, and higher prevalence um, in, in the, the, the invisibles were even higher on social problems. Why is this interesting? Because this means that already in adolescence there may be forming a group, in, in, at least in these countries, in these post-industrial countries, a group of people who, when we look at them, we don't tend to think they are at high risk. But it would be wise to take another look at this group and look for these signs because maybe these people have a higher probability than we think to develop those three characteristics which are very, very also characteristic of, of the population of adult children. Adult children are addicted to media. They, 
the, their sleep is completely offbeat and they're sedentary because they're withdrawn, they don't go out of the house. So there's a lot of research to be done here still to understand this, but it's a possible beginning for, of a possible aspect of an answer. Where do these people come from? Okay, um, what do we do about it? What, 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 what is our intervention here? Well, um, in 2009, we, a group assembled around Haim to try and understand more about uh, this, um, this, this group of people and their behavior and to try and learn how uh, NVR can help. Uh, this is a, a good opportunity for me after nine years of work to recognize the efforts of all the people who were involved here. Uh, and this group included Chaim Omer, of course, Eli Leibowitz, Yuval Nuss, clinical psychologist, Ohad Nahum, clinical psychologist, Navo Peak, clinical social worker, Dana Moore, clinical psychologist who also wrote a PhD on entitled dependence, Amos Piva, clinical psychologist, Mazal Landis, clinical social worker, Uri Nitsan, psychiatrist, no Miss Reilly, family therapist and psychologist, and myself. So it was really a group effort. These people came and went. Each one left his mark and left his contribution. So what did we understand? We understood that there is an intimate association between accommodation and a wide range of behavioral symptoms. We heard the word accommodation yesterday and before yesterday, mainly in Ellie's lectures and, and also in the workshops with Haim and Effie. Accommodation is important, we'll, we'll, we'll touch that later. Um, we learned that this condition of these adult, young adult people totally identifies between what is called illness and what is called dependence, which is an erroneous, it's a wrong way to, it's a wrong way to uh, equate between illness and dependence. Not everyone who's ill is dependent, and not everybody who's dependent is ill. But this is exactly the, 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 the important separation line that disappears in entitled dependence. This condition is experienced as a one degree of freedom condition. It is experienced as a condition of no other choice and hence the, the high suicidal fear and concern here because people feel trapped in it. And plus, we understood that failure to launch is no longer, to, failure to launch as, an, as, a, as a proactive word, failure to launch my son or daughter into life and the, an, or my failure as a young adult to launch into life is no longer an authority problem. It's not an authority problem. It's not a parental authority problem. It's not my authority problem. Rather, it's, a, it's an autonomy problem. So we understood that we need to go beyond what is called new authority here. We're still remaining within NVR, and we're still searching for the exact way or conceptualization of what we do, but we are beyond new authority here. Parental authority somehow ends, must end sometime, and if nothing else starts after that, functional, then we're, we have an adult child. So let's say something about the intervention. Um, I want to keep this very, very simple, the model of the problem. I know it's much more complicated than that. In a certain way, it will remind you a little of what you saw in Ellie's presentation uh, two days ago because it's exactly the same dependence accommodation paradigm. We have a highly dysfunctionally dependent adult child. We have a highly accommodating parent. And the more this cycle turns, the more psychiatric symptoms and others we see in the child, and the more the, parent, the wellness of the parent decreases. This is the basic situation that we are facing. And now, If we look, if we enter an adult ch child's room, we find this very enclosed space, very chaotic, uh, usually unclean. And this is what it looks like, this is what their a world looks like. It's just one picture, you know, not everyone has so, has, has so many 
<laughs> computer screens, and it, it, there's a variability here. This is just a symbol. And so this is what it looks from the inside. And, but how does it look from the outside? This is what it looks like from the outside. This is what the parent sees. This is what, this is what we, the therapists, see when parents describe to us this, um, this uh, uh, phenomenon. Um, why am I pointing this out? Because the parents, and now we're into what we do. What does the parent, what do parents do facing this, this kind of structure? The first instinct is to try and see what's inside. What's going on there? Is there movement? There are parents, there are 60 year old parents who wake up in the middle of the night and go to, the, to her room, or, sorry, they come in the middle of the day because he sleeps at day. And to see if he breathes. Because that's the only time you can come into the room. Um, so, the, our instinct is to make the invisible visible. This is what we're trying to do. And the more we try to see, the darker it gets. And the more we try to pull the person out of this darkness, the more that person will cling into the darkness. We're talking, I'm trying to convey to you the intervention in, our sim in the simplest terms. So, and we call this, we call this hole. It's a shelter. We gave it, Heim gave it two words, which are two expressions which are very powerful. When, when parents hear them, things happen to them. Heim calls it the degenerative shelter, the shelter where, which Instead of supplying true safety and security, it does provide some form of insulation from all kinds of aversive stimuli in the environment, but it also degenerates. There's a price to pay. And also we call it the den of withdrawal because this is called a den. This is, a den is an enclosure where animals live. I'm not comparing these young people to animals. Uh, this is, I don't want to be misunderstood here. Um, but we call them the den of withdrawal and the degenerative, degenerative shelter. And our message is, you do not deconstruct the child, you deconstruct the shelter. This, this is, in, in a nutshell, what our intervention does. We try to take apart the shelter itself. Um, and this, we call it deaccommodation. There's accommodation, there, there's the opposite of the accommodation. The accommodation needs to be unilateral because we don't have the cooperation of the young, of the adult child. It, it should be non-escalatory and it should be collaborative. It should be done with other people, professionals and family. This is why NVR is so uh, useful here. And actually, if we work and we have good cooperation with the parents, the effects are visible within 10 meetings. The problem is that the shelter is actually the parent himself. The parent, the parent thinks he's looking, standing on the outside of this den looking in, but actually the parent is part of this structure that holds these young people. And the greatest challenge is motivating these parents to stop being that part. The problem is that Chaim said in, in, the first, in, the first pres in his opening presentation, and I, I totally know that from my work, that getting people to do something small already changes their attitude. It's not attitude first, not always attitude first and then action, but sometimes getting someone to do something small will change his attitude. That is right. But when it comes to parents of adult children, getting them to do that small thing Make an announcement. Make a small change in your everyday routine is incredibly difficult, much more difficult than parents of children because they are much more in despair than others. And also, we need to get them to do something or we need to restore their hope, some sense of hope. We have two to three minutes, uh, uh, minutes meetings to do that. It's not a long, it's not a long time. And the problem is that caregivers are vulnerable. The first intervention phase is still fragile. 
There's a long history of therapeutic failures. Most parents have been many places before they came to us and they failed, otherwise they wouldn't be coming. Sometimes you see one parent dragging in the other, like, I didn't, I'm here because of my wife, I didn't want to come. So there's a lot of couple problems also in tension around that. And people think that suffering is their only, how do you convince people who really are convinced that suffering is their only option to consider another option? That's, that's the question uh, we put to ourselves. So, I want to go very quickly over 11 things that parents say to us. Because this is our challenge. They say, my brain knows you are right. This is the first, first and second meeting. When we start pointing out some alternative to, to their unidimensional thinking, that I have to suffer. So, so, so the father usually says, my brain knows you are right, but my heart feels I have no choice or we see, your approach is not for us. It's very nice, it's really very, but it's not, not for us. Oh, announcement, oh, we did that already. We told him, we told her. Um, we have no supporters, we, we talk that, we talk a lot about that. Our child will not cooperate, what will you do then? And there's this, eh, what will you do? <laughs> yeah? Or, she is sick. She is totally incapable of any form of adult fun. She can't even cook for herself. Okay. Um, we're okay, this is our role. This, this is what parents are for. We're, we're, we're doing okay, we don't need intervention. The other type of parents says, okay, so tell me what to do. They come up with a notebook. And okay, tell me what to do, I'm writing. You, you, I'll do whatever you say. Just tell me what to do. And and there's a father who sits there very, very skeptical and say, yeah. So what do you want me to do? Throw her out of the house? Not prepare food for her? Starve her to death? These are difficult things to cope for. And of course, one of the greatest concerns is the suicide concern. Anything we change, anything we move will, will, will end in suicide. And of course, the couple thing. It's not me, it's her. It's not me, it's him. So, and, and this, is what we, this is what we face. Uh, I, will, I will skip that uh, because we're running out of time and I will, I will um, talk about the um, six things that we know and do facing these high obstacles at the beginning. The first thing we do The first thing we do is this, we pause, we breathe, we create or we maintain the distance we need in order to really get close to them. And this is very important because they are transferring their anxiety to us now and we need to hand it back a little more calm. We know that the people who need our help are also very afraid of it. And since they're very afraid of it, they will not take it just because we offer it to them. There need, we will need some form of interaction before these people even agree to hear about announcements and, and doing something. Also, I know that I will not necessarily succeed in each and every case. When they come into the room, I, I know that I will not necessarily be able to help them. And I want that to help me succeed. Because the, the calmer I am, the more renounced I am to the fact that I will not be necessarily be able to help them, the more effective I become. I will also, when I hear their problems, when I hear this long list of 11 things, I will engage in a compassionate dialogue with their denial, their shame, their identification with the child, the guilt, I will not argue with it. I will not fend it off. I will not try to move onwards to, let's do something. I will, but if it doesn't work, 
If there's still resistance there, I, I'll go back. No point in pushing. At the same time, I will in non-escalating way stand against denial, shame, etc. I will talk to these sentiments, but I will still maintain my own position that these things are right now hindering us from doing what you came here to do. And also I will reach out for anyone who may help me do my work. I want to give a few quick, okay. Plowing, harish in Hebrew, is a, a, a word we found or we started using in the cases of adult parents because we realized that we hear on very, very hard ground, very resistant ground. And the plowing part is where we open up this ground, we turn it upside down, we're looking for opportunities. We need to prepare this ground for our seeds to be really effective there. We can't just go. So we call it the plowing stage. It's, it's before the announcement. It's, it's before get your supporters here and we'll get moving. It's, it's before doing, it's on our way to doing. Um, I just want to give a few quick examples of this plowing dialogue. The mother says, yes, but this is his home. It's his home. How can I ever expect him to leave home? It's his home. And we say to her, no, this is not his home. Even when he was five, it was not his home. It is your home. It is his home in your home. The father says, yes, same sentence, but another emphasis. This is his home. This is his home. I, I had a young, I, I had uh, the parents of a young man, 15 years old, who burned, he burned his mother's house. I mean, he, he made a fire and it's quite, quite considerable damage. And she sits there and she tells me, yes, but this is his home. And I need to talk to that. I need to empathize with her pain with her, um, with her shock, with her trauma of seeing her son burning down part of the house. And at the same time, I need to explain her that a home that is being burned is not a home. A place where you can burn things, shout, attack, terrorize, oppress, stops being a home. It's okay, it has walls, it has a roof, but it's not home, so it's not home. I am cutting her off from life when we're talking about, um, take the internet away. Um, taking the internet away, the people who are addicted, we, we heard so, several, several examples of this cutting off, and the father said, no, but, but this is the last thing he has. Uh, uh, what, will, what contact he will have with the world if I cut it off? And to this we say, these are all forms of reframing the situation. No, we're not cutting him off. We are reconnecting him. This, the way he lives is, being, is, is called being cut off. There's another nice one, but I am his father. I have an obligation. I have a duty. I have a conscience. It's part of my identity. And in this case, we will ask this person, okay, so let's talk about what being a father means to you. What, what are we missing here in this role of parenthood. What about the parent, the part, the essential part of parenthood, where parents send their children off? It's as essential as protecting them, feeding them, teaching them, sending them off. What about that? Is that part of parenthood, of being a par parent? Ah, but she is our child. It is another very strong, powerful magic sentence that we need to deconstruct, plow, what, what, okay, she is your child. Now, what does her being a child mean to you? Occasionally, we will talk also about the way she was a child. These are very common things that we do uh, in, in a nutshell to reframe and conduct this dialogue at the beginning of uh, the interventions. Um, Sharon? Am I, am, do I still have any time? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's, let's go on to... Oh, but he will say. He will say. Father sits here. The mother sits here. I say, I sit here. And um, I tell them something like, 
Okay, so you can tell, you can tell him, of course, if you believe it yourself. This is not your home, this is your home, your home and our home. And then the father says, I had that example two weeks ago, the father says to me, well, yeah, but then he will say, go to hell. And he looks at me and he smiles. And for a second, I don't know if I'm talking to the father or I'm talking to the son. Because every such father and mother bring their child with them to the room. They are, they are together. So, um, I have my own trick, but of course it's not, you know, it, it is, we can be endlessly creative here. There's a little doll, a little simple children's doll, a, a cloth doll, an Ikea doll that I, I take out of the drawer and I put it on a chair and I say, okay, this will represent your daughter, okay? And when we want to hear her opinion, we'll ask her. But I was asking you about your opinion. So it's a, it's a it's, you know, it's a small, funny way of trying to separate between those two people who come mixed up together. Several other things. What we call the banality of the insufferable. People tell us that horrible things happen in their, day, in their, in their home every day. They are being beat up, their cars are stolen, their money, their credit cards are, are being stolen, their rights are being violated, and you, you know, you know the victim narrative? The victim narrative? Yeah, he pushed me, but he did not hit me. You know that? He, he, uh, it, yes, he stole, but it, uh, but it only happened once. So we try to make what is banal, abnormal, and what is inconceivable, the normal, again. We try to renormalize the norm, so to speak, when, when, we, talk in, when we talk to these parents. Many parents are trying to buy quiet. Parents of younger children want to buy quiet. Parents of older children pay ink more and more to, to buy less and less quiet. And the stakes are higher, the risks are higher, the probabilities of explosion are higher, and all because they are afraid of the explosion. So we say to them, let's learn how to contain this explosion. This is not new. This is something we all do. The only thing here the only different thing here is the intensity, the risk, the danger, the tension is higher. We talk to them about the difference between dependency and illness. That, that seems to work. And of course, we remind them again that it's their function to send their role. At 60, this is your role as a parent. This means being a parent. If you haven't done this when you're 60, you have not finished the project of parenthood. Sending your child off to life. Being a grandmother, being a grandfather is wonderful, but you know, it's not up to you really. It's, it's a gift you get. It's a bonus. And of course, another thing that helps is that we discuss a roadmap with them. We are very structured in saying, this and this and this and this is going to happen in the next meeting. And that kind of gives them a sense of safety. Or, or that somebody's guiding them. And we also try to teach parents to be able to imagine their child in a more functional way because they have lost that capability as well, and we try to help them achieve that. And all of this is on the way of doing that small step, that little something that Chaim talked about um, the day before yesterday, which really starts the engine rolling. Um, I think um, uh, there are also things that uh, I think I'm out of time, right? Okay. So um, I think this this is uh, this is good enough, and thank you very much. <laughs>